Jeremy Corbyn nació en Inglaterra y ha sido uno de los más destacados líderes de izquierda en Gran Bretaña en las últimas décadas. Comenzó su trayectoria política en 1974 como concejal del distrito londinense de Haringey, cargo que ocupó hasta 1983 cuando fue electo para un escaño en el Parlamento por el Partido Laborista, donde continúa hasta la fecha. De 2015 a 2020 fue líder de su partido fungiendo también como el líder de la oposición en el Reino Unido. El programa político de Corbyn es ecoambientalista, antirracista, antifascista, antiimperialista y a favor de la erradicación de la desigualdad social y la pobreza. Se ha manifestado en contra de la guerra de Vietnam, el apartheid y la invasión a Irak y ha promovido acuerdos internacionales para el desarme nuclear y apoyado la extradición del dictador Augusto Pinochet. También ha colaborado como observador electoral internacional en diferentes latitudes y mantiene una continua participación en el Consejo de Derechos Humanos de la ONU. Destaca también su trabajo por los derechos de la comunidad LGBT+. Por su destacada trayectoria, fue reconocido en 2013 con el Premio Internacional de la Paz Gandhi y en 2017 con el Premio Sean McBride de la Paz. Bienvenidos aquí a Diálogos por la Democracia. Tenemos un invitado de, de gran lujo, un gran, gran, gran amigo de, de México, de América Latina. Eh, este, aprovechando de las tecnologías, nos acompaña desde Londres. Jeremy Corbyn, bienvenido aquí a Diálogos por la Democracia en Terminal. Muchísimas gracias, John. Son un placer para mí. Uh, uh, hablamos contigo y espero un tiempo en México en el próximo mes o mes o mes. O. Eh, uh, muchísimas gracias por su trabajando y mucho gusto a México y al pueblo de México también. Thank you very much, Jeremy. We're going to try to do this in, in, in English with, with, with subtitles so it flows a little bit more, but... Um, Mi apología en español no bueno. <laughs> <laughs> no, es bueno, es bueno, es, es, es excelente. Uh, este, tu español, Jeremy, has, uh, has spent time in, in, in Chile, Latin America, is a great friend of Mexico. His, his wife, Laura Alvarez, is also a, a great friend of Mexico. She's originally from, from Mexico, lives with him um, there in London. And um, what a real pleasure to have you, um, Jeremy, on this, on, on this show. Um, uh, you uh, are a real uh, leader of, of progressive values of, of the left in, in the world in a situation in which everything seems to be getting more and more complex with this um, COVID problem, uh, with uh, the rise of... Uh, Uh, extreme right neo-fascist leaders throughout the world like Bolsonaro and, and Trump uh, and your own success uh, within the political sphere in, in London and Great Britain um, has been a real inspiration for us. Uh, tell us a little bit about your, your, this trajectory from as of 2015, particularly with the, the collapse of uh, the Labour government and um, how is it that, that, that you uh, uh, arrived to the presidency, the leadership of the, the Labour Party, um, and uh, what, what was that whole experience like for you? Well, I'd been in the Labour Party all my life. I joined the Labour Party when I was 16 as a young man living in the country in the Midlands, English Midlands in Shropshire. And um, my values are a socialist, my values are an environmentalist, my values are a humanitarian and a human rights campaigner. And that's what I've spent my whole life doing. And um, there's been ups and downs in the Labour Party. There are times when uh, many of us have been very, very disappointed. In the 1960s, we were disappointed that the then Labour leader, Harold Wilson, supported the American strategy in Vietnam, but did not send British troops to Vietnam. And uh, many years later, there was the whole debate about the Gulf War in 1991, and even worse, the Iraq War of 2003. And at times, the peace wing of the Labour Party, the human rights wing of the Labour Party, has been reduced in size and in influence. After the general election of 2015, in which Labour didn't win, I felt we didn't win because we offered a form of austerity a lighter form of austerity than was being offered by the Conservatives. But nevertheless, we accepted the traditional economic arguments that the working class communities and the poorest should pay for the economic crisis of 2008. And so 
I was nominated to be leader of the party. Um, it was a very difficult process. Uh, I had to receive the nomination of 35 fellow members of parliament. And I finally got on the ballot paper with one minute to spare when somebody <laughs> finally decided to nominate me. And so I got onto the, onto the ballot paper. And at that time, the, um, the betting shops gave us a 2,000 to 1 chance of winning. And in three months, we turned that round and we won with nearly 60% of the vote of Labour Party members, supporters and union members. But that was actually. I remember as a very exciting, a very exciting moment um, uh, in which uh, the Labour Party was, you know, turned to you, a uh, uh, socialist leader. You've been in Parliament for decades, decades, thirty-five years, thirty-five years, representing a working-class district um, with clear progressive values, and for the Labour Party to turn to you uh, at that moment of of, of crisis for them uh, was a real symbol and inspiration for the world. How did you achieve it going from <laughs> uh, being the, the, the underdog to being the, the leader of the left in, in England in three months? Well, Labour Party members and Labour supporters' views hadn't radically changed. What had changed was the process in the party where the power that used to lie solely with the leadership and the parliamentary caucus of the Labour Party shifted towards a wider membership, democratization in the party, which I've been part of that campaign for all of my life. That was a very significant part of it. But it was also that we were able to say, look, for the Labour Party to succeed in winning an election, we cannot go on being economic managers of the crisis of 2008, which was not of our making, was the making of the subprime mortgage market collapse of all the debt crisis of the um, previous decades, we have to have a policy which is about redistribution of wealth and power within our society, which has to be one of economic regeneration. But crucially, on the international stage, it's not got to be another Iraq war. It's not got to be the um, extraordinary rendition and abuse of human rights. It's got to be something very, very different. And it wasn't just me, it was a whole lot of people that put that forward. And in that summer of 2015, I did over 100 events, public events all over Britain, um, um, giving that message out. Yeah, it was an incredible defeat of the legacy of, of Tony Blair. I mean, Tony mm -hmm. Blair and Bill Clinton and others were the global representatives of, uh, you know, the new third way, the... the, the uh, um, uh, cleaning away of any supposedly socialist backgrounds to uh, the new the new left, um, but this victory of yours and, and and also you know Sanders in the United States and and uh, the rise of Menelson in, in in France and Podemos in Spain and and Morena in Mexico and other places uh, well, really I, represented a, a defeat of that mm. of that new now old left. Um, and well, I think people in Mexico I, should understand that the British political system is much more parliamentary based than the Mexican political system. Course. And the role of the parliamentary caucus is very big in British politics. It's much smaller in Mexico, where AMLO becomes president as leader of what is a relatively new party, mm -hmm. totally from outside the parliamentary system. That in Britain, it is very different. And so winning the leadership in 2015 was the first time that the political establishment had not had um, one of their own put into the leadership of a major party. Exactly. We're the defeat of the establishment. And now, um, over the last two elections, uh, you haven't been able to achieve the, the victory, the big victory of the prime minister. It's gone back to the to the right or maintained itself in the right. And now Boris Johnson, your own, your own Trump. I don't know if that's an exaggeration or not, or whether he's better or worse, <laughs> but does this mean the end of this, of this uh, miraculous moment, or are we just regrouping to um, come back either you or someone else representing a more authentic uh, um, progressive left? No, it doesn't mean the end of, uh, of it at all. It means quite the opposite. It means a continuation of the issues and the policies that we put forward. 
We campaigned in 2015 to win the leadership, as I said, on economic issues, on international policies. And during my time as leader of the party, uh, myself and this very big team we had around us developed a whole raft of new policies. Labour had moved itself into a position where, for example, they would sometimes indulge in the most awful language against people who are poor and rely on benefits from our own government, Department of Work and Pensions. And so we changed the language on that. We changed the whole narrative on economic strategy, one of investment, of redistribution of power and wealth, and of taxing the very wealthiest at a considerably higher level. But we also changed the debate on environment policies, on energy policies, and on international policies. And in the 2017 election, we started off from a very low base. Labour was given... I think 24% in the polls. By the end of the campaign, we'd put that up to just over 40%. The highest vote Labour had had for a very long time, and we came within spitting distance, as we call it, of um, getting at least a minority Labour government, at least being the largest party. 2019 election, two things come out of it. One is the um, issue of leaving the European Union dominated, as far as I was concerned, I was trying to move the debate beyond that as the kind of government we would be um, and also have a trade arrangement with the European Union in the future. But what was also interesting was all of the policies we put forward on environment, on in industry, on economy, on international, all received very large plus ratings. But we'd had um, four years of unremitting attacks from a very, very powerful right-wing dominated media in our society. And I'd been challenged once as leader in 2016. And so it, it was a, um, a complicated election. But we still received over 10 million votes. We received a higher vote than many um, European socialist parties achieved across the whole continent. And um, I don't go away from any of the policies we put forward. And as far as I'm concerned, they are still there, they're valid, and above all, millions of people agree with me. Of course, and in many ways, your policies, which some people like to say are somehow from the past, are actually in the future and today much more relevant than before with this COVID crisis, right? Well, of course, well many of the papers us. said that my policies were a um, were 1970s rewritten. If only we'd had those policies in the 1970s. Well, let's <laughs> deal with two issues, COVID and the environment. Mm -hmm. COVID obviously didn't appear until the turn of the year, December, January of this year. The World Health Organization warned about it. And uh, I was leader of the party. We took the issue up straight away. I appointed an emergency group in my shadow cabinet to deal with COVID. And we said, follow the testing, follow the advice, and follow the example set by South Korea and New Zealand of how they were dealing with it. And above all, if you expect people to lock down, as has happened in many countries, including my own, then you've got to give them the economic support in order to live. We put forward all of those views. But what COVID has shown is health inequalities in this country, in the USA, in Mexico, and all around the world. And unless we have a properly funded World Health Organization and properly funded health services around the world, we're all vulnerable in the future. Um, but what we've also developed is a real strategy on the environment. Listen, global warming is taking place. The polar ice caps are melting. The permafrost is melting in Siberia. The Amazon rainforest is burning. The sea levels are rising. The plastic pollution is reaching tragedy proportions around the world. We cannot go on as we are. But the solution isn't to blame people for being consumers. It's not to blame people for driving cars or working in polluting industries. It's to provide a green way to the future, a green, environmentally sustainable industrial revolution. 
And that is what we developed. And I was very proud of the work that um, was done by my team, particularly Rebecca Long Bailey, in developing an alternative green agenda, which was supported and popular. That has got to be the way forward. But we cannot deal with the world's environment if we continue at the same time to pursue free market economics and the politics of greed, which makes that minority impossibly wealthier at the expense of the poor majority. You cannot have both, environment and sustainability and inequality. Yeah, and like you said, this crisis, this COVID crisis is reminding us of the importance of these central issues, which are the issues of the future, not the past. Yes. Healthcare, environment, <clears throat> inequality. Um, tell us a little bit about the National Healthcare Service. I think that people in Mexico don't necessarily recognize the, the importance of that um, historic victory for the left and the importance to maintain it today in the attacks that are they're on as one of the, the, the central planks of, of, of the uh, British welfare state. I'm sure um, President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador won't mind me re retelling this story to you. On the day before he took the presidency of Mexico. I traveled with him um, in a car and then on the plane to Mexico City. And we're traveling in the car and going through the countryside, and I'm admiring the countryside, expressing some disappointment at palm oil plantations and so on. And then I said to him, Andres Manuel, when you're in government, and hopefully we're in government, what's the best way we can work together and support each other? And he said, Jeremy, your National Health Service is an example we'd love to follow because our National Health Service is health care free at the point of need for everybody without any regard to their wealth, poverty or situation, everybody. It has been undermined. Some of it has been put out to private contract and privatized, but the principle is still there. And it was a Labour principle of the 1945 to 51 Labour government. It was an Aaron Bevan, an ex-miner, who was the health minister who brought it in. And it's our proudest achievement. It's the most civilized thing uh, about our country. And I'm very proud of it. And we will always defend our NHS. And it's our NHS that has got us through this COVID crisis so far, but it's still under threat. And I think the example, and the WHO actually accepts the principles of our NHS, not an insurance-based system, not a pay-as-you-go system, free at the point of need, paid for through taxation. It is absolutely free for, for every, um, yep. every British citizen. Right? Yep. Uh, regardless of what your employment is, public, private sector, no distinct, distinction. And, and there is also a private uh, system for people who want to pay for it, I imagine, right? But private there is, hospitals. Um, Mm -hmm. There is some private provision. It's not very big. Personally, I would rather that it was a solely only public system. And indeed, one mm -hmm. of the policies I put forward in our manifesto was that we end all private contractors within the National Health Service. And so it becomes a solely publicly owned, publicly run and publicly employed service. I think that would be an important step forward. Um, but don't underestimate the level of public support there is for the NHS. And during the period of lockdown, every Thursday evening, we had a thank you to NHS and care staff. Mm -hmm. We all went out to our front door, front gate, and applauded the NHS, and everybody did. So not even Boris Johnson has, has taken a tack on, on the National Health Service. He's, he's not even the, the conservatives well, have, have they really pretend, tried to privatize things. They do give sir, lip service support to the NHS, but they have an act of parliament passed by the Cameron government in 2010, which became law in 2012, Health and Social Care Act, which does encourage the selling off of some services to the private sector. They're still under the NHS control, but they're run by the private sector. I think that's mm -hmm. wrong. I don't think people should make money out of our national health service. It should be a public service, but the principle of the NHS survives. Yes, it's, it's, it's impressive, these historic conquest um, achievements of, of the British people and, and each, each one of our country, you know, our, in Mexico, the equivalent would be the, the land redistribution of Cardenas or the oil expiration that is part of our um, 
Uh, Indeed, the parallel is in some ways the Cardenas legacy in Mexico, mm -hmm. which laid the foundations of the ideas of uh, fair ownership of land, the mm -hmm. ideas of rights within the constitution. And in the case of Mexico, crucially, the ownership of the natural resources by the public mm -hmm. in Mexico. They were huge, huge reforms. Yeah, exactly. These ideals of, uh, you know, uh, post Second World War for you guys, uh, during even for us, uh, um, uh, are coming back, are coming back. And I think they're, they're uh, this is not nostalgia. This is <laughs> recuperating the commitment um, to social and justice. I'm in, go to a, let me go to a, a brief in Mexico, um, break. I just say this. Whenever I'm in Mexico, what I enjoy is discussions with friends in the political parties, in the trade unions, and so on, about the need to develop a health service, and above all, a form of social security for the poorest people in Mexico. I know there is the support for older people in Mexico City, and I think it's uh, quite humbling when you see people getting their food vouchers each month and thanking AMLO for them from his time as mayor of Mexico City. But um, I'm looking forward to greater equality in Mexico as well. This is, this is now actually national policy, Jeremy. Um, the, I know. The, those um, scholarships for the elderly are now a national policy. We also have scholarships for youth, for students, for peasants, uh, um, for uh, um, disabled. Uh, all the different uh, groups for the indigenous um, population. Um, we don't have enough wealth to have, you know, a national basic income for everybody. Uh, that would be the ideal. Uh, but all the money has been channeled to social programs. Um, and this has been the, you know, Lopez Obrador theory of changing trickle down for trickle up, you know? But let's go I'm to a quick break. I'm looking forward to meeting Andres we'll, Manuel to discuss this. Yes, we'll, we'll, we'll go to a quick break. We'll be right back with Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, ah, bueno, mejor lo digo en español. No se vayan. Hasta <laughs> regresamos con Jeremy. Estar aquí. Unos minutitos. <laughs> Aquí estamos de regreso con Jeremy Corbyn, el, el líder, el, uno de los más importantes líderes de la izquierda en el mundo y el líder eh, hasta hace muy poco eh, este, del el, eh, Partido Laborista eh, y todavía parlamentario y una persona muy lucida. Este, so, Jeremy, uh, a few days ago, there was a, a presidential debate in the United States in which um, Trump made a a terrible spectacle, um, you know, demonstrated who he really was. The moderator went out of control. But what I was particularly worried about, about that debate and in general, the, the electoral campaign in the United States is kind of the bankruptcy, the ideological bankruptcy and the capacity to mobilize um, voters around a real progressive platform. Biden, this seems like he's sort of from the past. He's, he's I, the guy from the past. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, what's your observation of, 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 uh, of this ideological dispute in the United States and in the world in general? I watched quite a lot of the debate um, on catch-up uh, because it would have been three o'clock in the morning our time. <laughs> and um, the most interesting statistic I picked out of it was the debate lasted 90 minutes. There were 91 interruptions, 70 by Trump and 21 by Biden. And I thought the debate was, frankly, very, very disappointing. Trump was being um, objectionable towards Biden and was playing towards a very narrow, very right-wing base. And I don't think Joe Biden put across a very clear economic, social, or health strategy. Because if you think about it, in the USA, even with Obamacare improvements in health care, there are still many, many millions of Americans that get no health care whatsoever. There are many others who get very limited health care and go into bankruptcy and debt in order just to get treatment for what are often serious or major conditions. The levels of poverty in the USA and surely the exposure of the behavior of the police and the treatment of the black community by the killing of George Floyd and the growth of the Black Lives Matters movement. I thought all of that would have been mainstream in this. And the levels of unemployment and poverty in the poorest cities in the USA, as well as the environmental stuff, I thought all that should 
have been part of the debate. At the end of the debate, I felt quite sorry for the guy who was trying to moderate it because he was getting shouted down <laughs> by both of them as well. I didn't think anything very positive came out of that debate. It was terrible to see how, how precisely Biden was cornered on these topics and he couldn't um, you know, defend uh, publicly and clearly uh, progressive principles. I think this has to do with the political culture in the United States uh, and the way in which elections are run. They're so money-centered. They're so focalized with electoral college on specific groups, specific areas. It's not really a national election. It's more of a dispute for particular swing votes in swing states with uh, you know millions of dollars um, invested there. But in general, it, it speaks to kind of a crisis in the, 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 the discourse and the, the ideology of the left, where do you see, I mean, Mexico, of course, I hope you see as a, as a hopeful place. Where else? Maybe Portugal, um, in Spain, Podemos has also gone through a, a, a terrible, not a defeat, but a, 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 a limitation of their growth. Uh, um, well, I love Mexico. Just temporary in general? Yeah, I love Mexico, and I'm very hopeful for, for the future. And having observed the um, outcome of the elections when AMLO was not elected in uh, 2006 and 2012, and that huge outpouring on the streets of Mexico City and elsewhere at those results, and then being present when he was inaugurated as president. And I was quite moved when he was welcomed as president by the representatives of the indigenous people of Mexico. That had never happened before with any previous president. And so um, I'm hopeful for Mexico, and I'm hopeful for the future of Mexico, and I think it's a very, very important position that you have um, uh, AMLO and Marcelo Ebrard as being very prominent leading figures in the government who are able to play an important part on the world stage. Now, globally, there have been huge ups and downs, and now I think we're in an age when people have less and less trust in mainstream media. In Britain, apparently 80% of the population don't trust what they read in the mainstream printed media. Interestingly, the figures in Germany and other European countries are much lower. There's much greater trust in their media mm -hmm. than Britain. But um, it's also the struggles that any national government has to try and bring about real social change because we have very powerful global corporations, a very powerful global trading system that gives poor countries a very hard time. And if you look at the experience in, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, in Chile, in Argentina, in Venezuela, and so on, where there's been huge international pressure put on governments trying to do progressive things. And yes, I've, um, I've been in Portugal and I've spoken at length with uh, friends in the Portuguese Socialist Party and their left coalition government and what they've achieved. And I've done the same with people in Spain. And uh, I think there are hopeful signs there. And uh, also I've spoken with people in Brazil. I've had meetings with uh, Dilma and with Lula on the way in which um, things can go forward in Brazil. So I don't want you to ever write off the experience <laughs> of the last couple of decades, which has been one of this huge growth of a conscious socialist-led ideas about environment, redistribution of wealth, um, and, and control in our lives. But we're seeing a global fight back on this, and uh, I'm actually hopeful. Who would have thought that uh, Bernie Sanders would come so close to winning the Democrat nomination as a socialist in the United States? That is something remarkable. And those millions who supported Bernie Sanders aren't going to go away any more than the millions of predominantly young people across Europe that have supported left movements. And so I am actually hopeful on the sense of um, unity of progressive people around the world. Our job is to bring those people together. And the one big lesson of the COVID crisis has been that we all learn to talk to each other on Zoom. You and I are Zooming time. <laughs> it's a Zooming day. It's wonderful. And uh -huh. so if we can have these conferences during the corona crisis, why weren't we doing it before? I did a meeting <laughs> with Dilma. We had 200,000 people at it. Well, 200,000 would be a big public meeting. We can do it. 
Yes, that's a good point. And, and especially this uh, um, closeness of yours to, to Mexico and our admiration for the, the history of the Labour Party and, and politics in England, I think can, can, is, is a particular value added to the relationship between Mexico and, and, and England. Tell me a little bit more about the, the press, because this is a big topic here in Mexico as well. Of course, ever since, even before López Obrador uh, came to the presidency, he has been a victim of a constant attack by the corporate media. And now as president, it's funny, you know, the, the, the same private um, media corporations who before defended the president um, based on sort of institutional um, yeah. patriotic grounds, now those same um, uh, corporate uh, 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 media now attack López Obrador for every possible little detail. You know, if his, his shoes aren't particularly buffed, um, is his front page news, they make up, they make up lies. I know that you've been a victim also of, you've been accused of being anti-Semite. It, uh, incredible, <laughs> but that news, knowing you and your, your incredibly plural and open and humanist approach to religion in the world, uh, um, how have you suffered that and how have you responded because it's hard you know so Lopez oh. Obrador responds it, in his daily um, morning conference defending himself and then they accuse him again of, of censorship for instance I mean it's it's a it's a vicious cycle well indeed um, I did some statistics um, in the 2019 election um, and in the last week of the campaign 97% of British media were either critical or downright hostile to Labour, mm -hmm. and in particular to me. I read uh, some of the, the week before the election. This was an, an election, the, the, uh, crucial election week. the crucial election moment. Mm -hmm. The crucial week when people are deciding to vote either by mail, because quite a lot do in Britain, or physically at the polling station on election day. I read the newspapers for polling day. Uh, one paper had 20 pages of attacks on me. Page after page after page. The day of the election. Yes, on election day itself. And that was the 2019. 2017 wasn't much better. And we've had five years of unrelenting um, media attacks and abuse on me. Uh, and on others in the party. Um, to the extent that some of it is so ludicrous, it is laughable. I mean, as you know, I enjoy cycling. I have a bicycle. In fact... I can let you into a secret. I've got three bicycles. <laughs> Excessive, I know, but I do. I, do. Um, I was accused, not of being a cyclist, but of riding a Maoist bike around my community. It's not, it's not a Maoist bike, it's a bicycle, like any other bike. It's that but made in China, what was, what was the supposed problem? Well, you know, it, it's got a... It's got to have some connotation that somehow or other riding a bicycle is an extremist thing to do. In my community, <laughs> it's a pretty normal thing to do. But it's that sort of abuse that um, we've received the whole time. And so this is a very serious time. Now, I remember staying with Laura's family um, after AMLO had been defeated in both 2006 and in 2012. And I remember I was quite tired. I said, oh, I'm ready to go to bed. They said, no, no, we've got to stay up. Why? So, because AMLO is on at midnight. Because AMLO had to buy television time mm -hmm. in the middle of the night in order to get a message across. That was how bad it was for him. And now I'm full of admiration for his daily press conferences. And when he told me he was going to do daily press conferences, I said, are you really sure about this? Do you really want to expose yourself to the hassle of being hounded by the media at seven o'clock every morning. And he said, no, it's the only way, because if it's done live, it's very hard to edit it and to censor it. I admire him for that, and I admire what he's doing. Because um, on the left, we've got to change our ways in how we communicate. Um, I was born into an age when political communication was the public meeting was knocking on people's doors and giving out leaflets. Knocking on doors is very important. Public meetings are very important. But most people, particularly those under 40, get all their information from social media. We've got to be there on social media. And I think we have to also recognize the right can just as easily use social media. They can use of the course. algorithms that work out what you want, what you say, and what you think. And social media can be just as isolationist 
as mainstream media. Many people set up their own system to receive the news they want to receive. And so they end up being, without realizing it, putting themselves in a sealed container in which they're fed the news that they think they want to hear. And so it is, it's not easy. It is up to us to reach out in the way you and I are having this very good discussion today, but also to carry that wider. And I was talking last week to Evo, who is now um, living in... Evo Morales. Evo, Evo Morales, yes. The, uh, I was talking to him, and uh, he is doing his best to reach out to often very remote and poor communities across Bolivia. How? By people gathering around a screen where he's talking to them on social media. Ten years ago, that would have been unlikely. 20 years ago, it would have been completely impossible. And so let's remember the way in which technology can work to our advantage. Um, and I take my hat off to those that defeated apartheid in South Africa, to the way Salvador Allende won the election in Chile in 1970, in an age when there was no social media. It was all done by the power of an individual persuading others for the justice of a better future. Yes, it's a, a real hope of using the, the network, social networks, the Lopez Obrador has also used it at, uh, for this, uh, getting through the message of authenticity. But there's also, of course, as you said, a risk. Uh, I mean, the, the right learned very quickly that this platform um, can also be infiltrated by money and power. Well, can we just talk and, for a um, second about... Particularly the, in... Yeah. Excuse me? Go, uh, go ahead, the, the media in Britain... Um, is um, it thinks of itself as being very fair. And they keep on telling us they're the best media in the world and they're very <laughs> fair. Um, I absolutely beg to differ from that. They are an overwhelmingly conservative influence. And even the papers that would consider themselves to be liberal um, join in many of the very right-wing attacks on the left. It's as though there's a glass ceiling. And mm -hmm. our problem in the last five years was that we were breaking through this glass ceiling. And I tell you what, a lot of people on the other side of that glass ceiling didn't like it and didn't want it. And so I challenged the question of media ownership, and I put forward two proposals. One was that there's a, an inquiry called Leveson that was done into the right of reply and the issues of um, multiplicity of media ownership. We challenged that. And I went to the Edinburgh Festival in 2018 and gave what was historically known as the MacTaggart Lecture. It's in honor of Mr. MacTaggart. And I gave this lecture about how there had to be an open and free media. We had to respect those real journalists like Aristadian, many others that have done so much to open up, um, open up the airwaves to other people and challenge it. But we had to do that in the context of plurality of ownership and plurality of, uh, of access to it. Remember in the USA, the idea of fairness in the media was knocked on the head by Reagan. The role of public service broadcasting was diminished to the point of almost irrelevance within the USA. And that same process is at work with, with international media corporations, particularly Fox News and the Murdoch Empire are part of that. And so it is important that those of us who want to see a different and better world recognize the importance of communication. Yeah, this is, I think, one of the, the, the major topics of, of, of today, beefing, you know, strengthening uh, public media as well as in, in, in Mexico is important as a, as a, a way of, of, of creating a better balance, equilibrium between the different forms of expression. And like you're talking about, uh, antitrust uh, um, legislation for media, you know, they did it in Argentina. In, in Mexico, Lopez Obrador hasn't put it on, uh, on the top of his... His agenda, what he said is that it's, you know, with this new uh, media context of the social networks, we now have uh, automatically more plurality and the uh, audience can, can choose. Um, he's committed, as you have also uh, did during your campaign, bringing internet to everywhere, not to the, even the, the highest mountains of the south of Mexico well, that I was has told access it was... to their to, yeah. to different information. So this is a way, but then also these corporations, you know, Facebook, Google, Twitter, 
um, are also private corporations which can you know censor uh, um, use their algorithms like you said close people into their little boxes um, it's not a magic oh. bullet either there is a you're, you're quite correct I mean there is a, a an issue here that we've got to address that um, Facebook Twitter Google all that are American companies based in the USA who've shown themselves quite prepared to do deals with um, countries that abuse human rights, mm -hmm. do deals in order to close down access to their media. And uh, I think it's important that we build up the principle of public service access for all of us to social media. I proposed during the election campaign, one of our policies, which was free internet, broadband internet for everybody across the UK on the principle that we have in Britain, it's known as the Royal Mail Service, which is universal access. Mm -hmm. We have universal access through the broadcasting license system to, of the BBC to every person in, in the country. I think those are important. I was told this was ridiculously expensive and impossible. I now find Boris Johnson is now in agreement with me because of the COVID <laughs> crisis. People actually need access to it. But access to broadband isn't enough. It has to be access to the internet um, and not have that moderated by somebody else from somewhere else. And I think that is the key. And I think we need to have this um, global discussion about access to information. Information should be available to all at all times. Scientific information is shared. Political and humanitarian information should be shared in exactly that same principle. Uh, let's go to a second um, break. We'll be right back. Well, ahorita regresamos con nuestro invitado de lujo hoy, Jeremy Corbyn. No se vayan. En unos minutitos estamos de regreso aquí en la última parte de la entrevista. Muchas gracias. Aquí seguimos con nuestro gran amigo este, Jeremy Corbyn, eh, un hombre muy solidario con las luchas de, de izquierda de los pueblos del, del mundo, en México y, y, y más allá. Uh, a real privilege to be speaking with you, with you Jeremy. Uh, tell me about class struggle. Uh, people like to say today that, you know, the, the new left supposedly should leave this behind, unions, um, uh, but you are always very clear and direct about the, the need to continue to talk about this, not only talk about it, but to tax the rich, for instance, to support unions. Um, is this something that's still viable in the globalized internet economy? Oi, I, I think it's, it's more important than ever in a globalized um, internet-based economy. And uh, the idea that the working class... Uh, people that only work in heavy manufacturing industry or difficult service industry jobs. And somehow the rest of us are a middle class, white collar workers, sitting in an office somewhere, pressing computer buttons, um, are somehow they're not workers. If you're in a call center and you're taking calls and you're having to deal with all kinds of pressure, if you're a doctor, you're having to deal with a large number of patients. If you're a nurse, if you're a teacher, you're a worker. You're a worker just as much as somebody down a mine or in a factory. You do not control your own working environment. You do not control um, what happens to your life. And that's why the principle of class politics and the principle of trade union membership is so important in all circumstances. I, before I became an MP, was an organizer in the Public Service Trade Union. It was then called National Union of Public Employees. It's now Unison, which has over 1.3 million members in Britain, which is very large for a union in Britain. And I was very proud of uh, the work we did in empowering people, in getting better working conditions for them, in winning the principle of a national minimum wage and maintain and developing that whole, uh, whole idea of the social wage within our society. Unions are absolutely crucial. And I was um, in a very interesting meeting with the International Labour Organization last year to discuss how um, our government would bring in full ILO conditions. And I know many people in the unions in Mexico. The ILO, the International Labour Organization, oh, uh, just to clarify for our audience, yeah. <laughs> yes, the International Labour Organization, interestingly set up in 1919 at the end of the First World War to give an international voice to the voice of working class people 
across the world. And so I think that whole class thing is very interesting. Now, I'll give an example of how during a crisis, people don't necessarily go for the individual solution. They go to the collective solution. Um, because of the COVID crisis in Britain, there's been a huge pressure on our teachers and our education system. Within a, a few weeks, 15,000 people, teachers who were not members of the union, decided the union spoke for them and joined the union. In a crisis, people don't necessarily turn in on themselves, they turn towards each other. There's never been a more important time for there to be that international working class voice. And so I think trade unions have an absolutely huge role to play. But it's funny how people are, many people, voices, dominant voices, are still trapped in the Cold War mentality. Um, the Cold War ended you know, 30 years ago, uh, and people kind of repeat this, that you know, anybody who talks about class, anybody who talks about working class, anybody who talks about unions is immediately a, a communist, right? Yep. Um, without even understanding what that concept means, right? Communist is common, com uh, commun, no? Like uh, common values, uh, social uh, transformation. And, and they immediately, you know, bring in the images of, of Stalin or even Hitler. It's just, it's crazy how people are just sort of stuck in this old mentality and not open to even well, talking about these issues. It's how we relate to people and how we communicate. If you give people a lecture on ideology and mm -hmm. refer them to a hundred different books, I think you've lost your audience straight away. Mm -hmm. If people say to me, Jeremy, why are you a socialist? I say, because I love our National Health Service. And they look at me, oh, what do you mean? So I describe the principle, health care, provided by all of us, for all of us, called socialism. And then from that point on, you've got a rapport, you've got a dialogue. And it is the experience of people. Listen, if there's litter in your street, do you either complain about it or do you do something about it and get together to make sure there is a public service to pick up the trash that's left in your street. It's a, it's, ba it's a basic human instinct that people actually do things together. And surely the history of Mexico has to be, the Mexican Revolution was about people coming together against autocracy. The independence of Mexico was people coming together against the um, colonial domination by Spain. And it is about the cultural liberation of people to their own lives and their own experience. Mexico is the richness of your history, the wonder of your diversity is there, and it's collective. I was reading some other interviews that you've given, particularly about the left in Latin America, in which you um, have spoken about how you yourself has learned from um, from this uh, syncretic, eclectic, uh, um, embedded uh, um, uh, socialism that we have in in, in Mexico and in, in Latin America, what what are the, the the particular values or principles that you've learned from from Latin America in terms of rethinking the left? The way in which the um, people of Latin America have come together to try and develop a social and economic system that doesn't rely on the extraction of raw materials and basic agricultural crops to a market somewhere else, but develops and envelops the culture of the, uh, of the society that's there. Both the imported culture in the, in the sense of the culture that's come from Spain during the colonial period, but also the indigenous culture that's there from the Native American peoples. Now, when I was a, a young man, I had the joy and education of going to the Caribbean as a volunteer when I left school. And I lived in Jamaica. I was teaching geography, but I was learning far more than I taught. And I listened and learned from a lot of people about the legacy of slavery, the legacy of the slave trade, the oppression of, um, uh, of indigenous languages. And then after that, I traveled all around South America. And the, there were many experiences that were in my mind. 
One was being arrested in most countries I went to, which was, <laughs> which was interesting. I probably unwisely went to demonstrations in every country I, I visited. I, I, I was noticing that you're also, you're also the, the, the member of parliament who has been most, um, common, most frequently uh, um, called to attention for you know, breaking the rules, right? <laughs> well, indeed. Stuff happens in life. But um, what impressed me was being in Chile in 1969, when popular unity, the coming together of the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the Christian left, and others in order to form popular unity, which subsequently elected Salvador Allende into the presidency. And the way in which they used culture, and uh, Victor Hara and the others who sang for the people there and got that sense of cultural expression and cultural values of working class communities and the way in which uh, Allende and others recognized the rights and values of the Mapuche and other peoples in Chile. And then I spent some time in Bolivia. And to me, it was absolutely fascinating. Going to a country, the majority of the population not necessarily speaking Spanish, speaking Quechua and other languages, and visiting very isolated communities and just observing life, observing the veneer of the Spanish colonial imposition on their lives, but in reality, the continuation of the traditions that had been there right from the Inca period onwards. It was an absolutely fascinating experience. And so what I under, hope I understand is the amalgamation of all of those experiences and values that makes a very complicated but also a very strong society. Being diverse is not a weakness. Diversity and understanding diversity, religious plurality, cultural plurality, linguistic plurality is actually a strength, not a weakness. Yes, fascinating. The, the, the story you tell about your own uh, process of, of, of consciousness, uh, of transformation of consciousness and, and recognition of the, the, the special elements of, of the general society and also, you know, progressive politics and ideology in Latin America. And this is what is explained, uh, you know, the, the famous pink wave, uh, um, the arrival of, of, of very progressive uh, uh, radical even governments in Bolivia and Ecuador and Venezuela, Argentina, Brazil itself. Uh, and it's been incredible, the, the, the backlash. Uh, you're one of the first international voices to denounce the, the coup in, in Bolivia in 2019. You've also been very close to the solidarity with, for example, Rafael Correa, who's also been uh, accused of terrible uh, and made up uh, um, um, supposed crimes. Yeah, uh, I met Correa in Brussels such last a, year. Yeah, why is there such a, 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 a an angry attack against these governments when, in principle, they're looking as to you know uh, defend communal, um, progressive justice values of oh, justice? Um, is it kind of all about lithium, or is it about yeah. Yeah. economic issues, or what, what's what's at the base of this all? I think it's fundamentally on economic issues. Correa and Evo Morales were both challenging the ownership of natural resources in their countries by foreign country, countries and companies. And they were both um, looking at the way in which the international trade organizations often work against uh, governments that are trying to redistribute power and wealth. And, uh, they paid a price for it. And so we went through periods in Latin America, particularly in South America, where there were military dictatorships. 1960s, military governments in pretty well every country there. Um, I remember going to um, demonstrations in Brazil and Argentina when I was there as a young man and seeing the brutality of the way in which the police and the army broke up demonstrations. And then we went through the, the growth of the left, the unity of the left, and we made a, a lot of progress. And then the brutality of the coup against Allende in 73, the um, Operation Condor, which, um, in which 25,000 people disappeared. Um, and then now a different form, lawfare. Lawfare that came in against Evo, which came in against Lula and what is now happening in that whole process. And so I remain very hopeful that the strength of popular opinion 
across Latin America for a sustainable future, for protection of the natural world and environment, but above all, the redistribution of power and wealth is there. Yes, and it, uh, some people have even spoken of a uh, 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 Condor, uh, Operation Condor 2.0, no, in the digital era, no? <laughs> They're using the, 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 the digital networks, um, which, as we've said, creates lots of potential for authentic communication, now as also a way of, of, of creating the conditions for lawfare or for um, yeah. coups, uh, which has also been a, a major struggle. Today, Venezuela has been a case which has been terrible in terms of this international attack, but it's also incredible. You know, there's Maduro still there. The, the, the revolution is still uh, alive. Uh, the British government has had a terrible role in this in terms of the uh, uh, Venezuelan reserves which are there. Is there any possibility that the, that the international community could actually be convinced to um, defend democracy in, in Venezuela beyond ideology? Well, I think the um, requests that have come from the government in Mexico and the previous government in Argentina for some kind of um, talks and negotiated process are important. And it's also important that the um, Venezuelan economy be diversified away from oil because oil prices are always fluctuating, always risky to uh, the whole economy to rely on oil. And that diversity is very, very important, that has to be developed there. So an economic model that um, is more sustainable at a local level, I think is a very important thing forward, going forward. Yes, and uh, another uh, hot spot is Brazil. Uh, Bolsonaro is, is uh, unbelievable. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's just like, it's like Trump. It's just incredible how the the, the, the oligarchs, the military, you know, in this case, uh, the Brazil was under you know military rule for twenty years, um, come back in this revanchismo, no, this this this, this uh, 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 venganza. This uh, how do you say it? English? I'm forgetting my English, Jeremy. The, <laughs> Yeah. Revenge, well, revenge. The rise of the, popu the, the, populist, the populist right uh, around mm -hmm. the world are a serious issue. But it's also popular if you talk to people and with people about their own experience and above all empowering them. The populist right only offer actually increasing the wealth gap and oppression mm -hmm. of some handy minority. So you attack refugees, you attack migrants, you attack homeless people, you attack landless people. There's always some minority you can attack. And usually it's possible to, for a while, generate a whole lot of hatred towards them. But what's far more powerful are people united together saying, actually, somebody sleeping rough on the streets of my town is morally wrong for them and for me. Somebody who seeks asylum as a refugee, are they a threat or are they a human being just like you and just like me who wants somewhere safe and secure to live? And so I think the power of that morality of people doing things together is far greater than the um, ephemeral presence of a right-wing populist who's attacking minority. But don't underestimate the way in which the right have risen um, using... Uh, anti-black racist language in the United States, anti-Semitic language in, in Central Europe, um, anti-Muslim language in other places, anti-Hindu language. There's always somebody you can attack. And so it is important that we get that sense of those community values together. That's what the left has to do all the time. <clears throat> because we're trying to redistribute. Exactly. Thank you so much, Jeremy. This has been a, a wonderful discussion with you, which... Um, uh, demonstrates who you are and what you represent as a, as a, a very important global humanist um, socialist leader uh, with an inspiration to all of us here in Mexico and in Latin America. Um, hope you come to visit us physically uh, soon once again. Hopefully um, December. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. If, if, if COVID and politics permit it, you will if be COVID here. If COVID allow, I'll be there. 
<laughs> wonderful. It'll be wonderful to give you a, a, a safe hug at a distance. Um, always welcome to Mexico. Um, oh, our best to, to Laura Alvarez and, um, and to all the Labour Party in, in, in Britain, which who were very um, uh, generous with us in 2018. You guys sent a whole delegation of electoral observers in 2018. We'll always be, always be very thankful um, uh, to that uh, contribution to the fight for democracy. Uh, and um, hope we get to talk again very soon. Soon. Thank you very much, sir. John, thank you. And I think we should thank Laura Alvarez for arranging the delegations to the election. I look forward to seeing you. Thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Y muchas gracias a usted, amable audiencia, como siempre, por acompañarnos. Lo esperamos de nuevo en ocho días aquí en Diálogos por la Democracia de Terrenal.